Official Account of the Death of Archbishop Seegers by John H. Keatley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The tragic death of the heroic Archbishop Seegers produced a deep impression upon the Catholics of this country at the time of its occurrence. The first official statement of the murder was made by Mr. John H. Keatley, a former United States judge in Alaska, to his eminence, Cardinal Gibbons. As an official historical document, it is entitled to a place in these pages. Sioux City, Iowa, March 21st, 1892. Cardinal Gibbons, Baltimore, Maryland. Very dear sir, having served as the united states judge of alaska until december eighth eighteen eighty nine and archbishop seegers of british columbia having been murdered by one of his associates within the limits of alaska in the year eighteen eighty seven i deem it my duty after having become acquainted with all the principal facts they being somewhat scattered among documents and held in memory by persons now widely dispersed to present them to you in this form in a concise narrative so that you may file it in the archives of the cardinalate if you desire for future reference the extraordinary and tragic character of the incident resulting in the death of the bishop is a sufficient justification of this course up until the spring of eighteen eighty seven no serious attempt had been made to establish any roman catholic missions among the natives of the valley of the yukon in alaska owing in part to the opposition made by the greco-russian priests and monks subject to the jurisdiction of the holy synod at moscow russia and to the opposition made for a century and more by the officers of the hudson bay company whose agents have been operating along the headwaters of that great river for several generations a change of policy was deemed necessary and consequently on the thirtieth of july eighteen eighty seven archbishop seegers left victoria british columbia accompanied by two jesuit fathers tosi and robot and a servant named frank fuller by august thirty first the party was heard from at the head of salmon river in western alaska by a letter from the archbishop stating that the party was having some trouble with the natives this did not alarm his friends and the news of august thirty first being the last heard from him for many months it did not create any uneasiness owing to the fact that it frequently requires an entire year to receive intelligence from those remote regions and even from united states officials who are able to command better facilities for communications than many others the next intelligence received from the archbishop and his party was that on the morning of november twenty seventh he was shot and killed by frank fuller near a native village called nulato on the yukon river Fuller was about thirty years of age, was tall and slender, and of a nervous, excitable temperament. He had been a watchmaker at Portland, Oregon, before going to Victoria, and meeting Archbishop Seegers at Victoria, and expressing a strong desire to accompany the party to the Yukon, he was taken as the Archbishop's personal attendant. This was contrary to the advice of the other members of the party when they reached the chilkoot village preparatory to crossing the coast range by the chilkoot pass to the headwaters of the yukon father tosi strongly urged the archbishop to send fuller back to the settlement as a last opportunity on account of his singular behavior which indicated some unsoundness of mind the party continued together until they reached the mouth of the stuart river in western british america where fathers tosi and rabot established themselves to winter and archbishop seegers proceeded down the yukon the father still protesting against his going alone with young fuller on account of his strange and inexplicable conduct the archbishop was resolute and refused to believe that he was in any danger whatever they had one indian with them and proceeding to the point near nulato which they reached on the evening of november twenty sixth eighteen eighty seven they went ashore and encamped about daylight on the morning of november twenty seventh fuller went to where the archbishop was sleeping in the tent called him as if to awaken him to begin the journey for the day and when the prelate attempted to rise he was shot by fuller and mortally wounded 
with the gun which had all along been part of the outfit of the expedition the indian started down the river with the archbishop who died the same day and finally deposited the body at st michael's in bering sea where it was taken in charge and where it was deposited in the old russian church at that place by the russian priest stationed at st michael's in the early summer of eighteen eighty eight a burial case was sent from victoria to st michael's for the purpose of bringing home the body either by a revenue cutter or by one of the steamers of the alaska commercial company trading on that coast the united states steamer thetis then commanded by lieutenant commander w h emory of the united states navy when coming out of the arctic ocean to return to san francisco by way of sitka touched at st michael's disinterred the remains placed them in the burial case and brought them away while the thetis remained at sitka during the month of october eighteen eighty eight awaiting final orders i had an opportunity of viewing the face of the dead archbishop as his body lay in the burial case on the quarter-deck of the vessel it did not seem to have suffered much change though almost a year had elapsed since his death his remains were landed at victoria about the middle of november eighteen eighty eight and permanently interred at that place fuller found his way to unalaska where he was arrested and brought to sitka for trial along with the indian who had been of the party and was detained as a witness fuller was defended by hon a k delaney the united states collector of customs at sitka and interposed the defense of insanity fuller testified on his own behalf and stated that he was in constant apprehension that the archbishop intended killing him upon the first opportunity and to prevent his own death in that way he had taken the archbishop's life a diary subsequently found kept by him up to the time of the tragedy showed numerous entries where apprehension of death from the hands of the archbishop were expressed upon being asked if the archbishop had been unkind to him in any way during any part of the journey from the time of starting he replied he had not the jury were instructed that they must find him either guilty of murder in the first degree or acquit him on account of his insane delusion but strange to say they brought in a verdict of manslaughter his counsel made no motion to set aside this verdict and he was sentenced to an imprisonment at hard labor for a period of ten years at the washington penitentiary at mcneil's island in puget sound where he still is a report was published a year ago that he had made his escape from the island with heavy shackles upon him but after inquiry i find that there is no truth in the publication archbishop seegers was born in belgium and at the time of his death was thirty-nine years of age he came to victoria british columbia in eighteen sixty three and in eighteen seventy nine was created archbishop of oregon in eighteen eighty three he resigned and returned to victoria to devote the remainder of his life to the christian welfare of the indians of british columbia and the natives of the north pacific coast the foregoing statement of the deplorable affairs is from official documents evidence in court and from eye-witnesses and is as near the truth as it can ever be ascertained yours very sincerely and respectfully john h keatley end of the official account of the death of archbishop seegers by john h keatley read by phil schempf the place of signs in a liberal education by bertrand russell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org science to the ordinary reader of newspapers is represented by a varying selection of sensational triumphs such as wireless telegraphy and aeroplanes radioactivity and the marvels of modern alchemy it is not of this aspect of science that i wish to speak science in this aspect consists of detached up-to-date fragments interesting only until they are replaced by something newer and more up-to-date displaying nothing of the system of patiently constructed knowledge out of which almost as casual incident 
have come the practically useful results which interest the man in the street the increased command over the forces of nature which is derived from science is undoubtedly an amply sufficient reason to encourage scientific research but this reason has been so often urged and is so easily appreciated that other reasons to my mind quite as important are apt to be overlooked it is with these other reasons especially with the intrinsic value of a scientific habit of mind informing our outlook on the world that i shall be concerned in what follows the instance of wireless telegraphy will serve to illustrate the difference between the two points of view almost all the serious intellectual labor required for the possibility of this invention is due to three men faraday maxwell and hertz in alternating layers of experiment and theory these three men build upon the modern theory of electromagnetism and demonstrate the identity of light with electromagnetic waves the system which they discovered is one of profound intellectual interest bringing together and unifying an endless variety of apparently detached phenomena and displaying a cumulative mental power which cannot but afford delight to every generous spirit the mechanical details which remain to be adjusted in order to utilize their discoveries for a practical system of telegraphy demanded no doubt very considerable ingenuity but had not that broad sweep and that universality which could give them intrinsic interest as an object of disinterested contemplation from the point of view of training the mind of giving that well-informed impersonal outlook which constitutes culture in the good sense of this much misused word it seems to be generally held indisputable that a literary education is superior to one based on science even the warmest advocates of science are apt to rest their claims on the contention that culture ought to be sacrificed to utility those men of science who respect culture when they associate with men learned in the classics are apt to admit not merely politely but sincerely a certain inferiority on their side compensated doubtless by the services which science renders to humanity but none the less real and so as long as this attitude exists among men of science it tends to verify itself the intrinsically valuable aspects of science tend to be sacrificed to the merely useful and little attempt is made to preserve that leisurely systematic survey by which the finer quality of mind is formed and nourished but even if there be present fact any such inferiority as is supposed in the educational value of science this is i believe not the fault of science itself but the fault of the spirit in which science is taught if its full possibilities were realized by those who teach it i believe that its capacity of producing those habits of mind which constitute the higher mental excellence would be at least as great as that of literature and more particularly of greek and latin literature in saying this i have no wish whatever to disparage a classical education i have not myself enjoyed its benefits and my knowledge of greek and latin authors is derived almost wholly from translations but i am firmly persuaded that the greek fully deserve all the admiration that is bestowed upon them and that it is a very great and serious loss to be unacquainted with their writings it is not by attacking them but by drawing attention to neglect of excellences in science that i wish to conduct my argument one defect however does seem inherent in a purely classical education namely a too exclusive emphasis on the past by the study of what is absolutely ended and can never be renewed a habit of criticism towards the present and the future is engendered the qualities in which the present excels are qualities to which the study of the past does not direct attention and to which therefore the student of greek civilization may easily become blind in what is new and growing there is apt to be something crude insolent and even a little vulgar which is shocking to the man of sensitive taste quivering from the rough contact he retires to the trim gardens of polished past forgetting that they were reclaiming from the wilderness by men as rough and earth-soiled as those 
from whom he shrinks in his own day. The habit of being unable to recognize merit until it is dead is too apt to be the result of a purely bookish life, and their culture based wholly on the past will seldom be able to pierce through everyday surroundings to the essential splendor of contemporary things, or to the hope of still greater splendor in the future. My eyes saw not the men of old, and now their age away has rolled. I weep to think I shall not see the heroes of posterity. So says the Chinese poet, but such impartiality is rare in the more pugnacious atmosphere of the West, where champions of the past and future fight a never-ending battle, instead of combining to seek out the merits of both. This consideration, which militates not only against the exclusive study of the classics, but against every form of culture which has become static, traditional, and academic, leads inevitably to a fundamental question, what is the true end of education? But before attempting to answer this question, it will be well to define the sense in which we are to use the word education. For this purpose I shall distinguish the sense in which I mean to use it from two others, both perfectly legitimate, the one broader and the other narrower, from the sense in which I mean to use the word. In the broader sense, Education will include not only what we learn through instruction, but all that we learn through personal experience, the formation of character through the education of life. This aspect of education, vitally important as it is, I will say nothing, since its consideration would introduce topics quite foreign to the question with which we are concerned. In the narrower sense, education may be confined to instruction, the imparting of definite information on various subjects, because such information, in and for itself, is useful in daily life. Elementary education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, is almost wholly of this kind. But instruction, necessary as it is, does not per se constitute education in the sense in which I wish to consider it. Education, in the sense in which I mean it, may be defined as the formation by means of instruction, of certain mental habits, and a certain outlook on life and the world. It remains to ask ourselves what mental habits and what sort of outlooks can be hoped for as the result of instruction. When we have answered this question, we can attempt to decide what science has to contribute to the formation of the habits and outlook which we desire. Our whole life is built about a certain number, not a very small number, of primary instincts and impulses. Only what is in some way connected with these instincts and impulses appears to us desirable or important. There is no faculty, whether reason or virtue, or whatever it may be called, that can take our active life and our hopes and fears outside the region controlled by these first movers of all desire. Each of them is like a queen bee, aided by a hive of workers, gathering honey. But when the queen is gone, the workers languish and die, and the cells, and the cells remain empty of their expected sweetness. So with each primary impulse in civilized man, it is surrounded and protected by a busy swarm of attendant derivative desires, which store up in its surface whatever honey the surrounding world affords. But if the queen impulse dies, the death-dealing influences, though retarded a little by habit, spread slowly for all the subsidiary impulses, and a whole tract of life becomes inexplicably colorless. What was formerly full of zest, and so obviously worth doing that it raised no question, has now grown dreary and purposeless. With a sense of disillusion we inquire the meaning of life, and decide, perhaps, that all is vanity. A search for an outside meaning that can compel an inner response must always be disappointed. All meaning must be at the bottom related to our primary desires. And when they are extinct, no miracle can restore to the world the value which they reflected upon it. The purpose of education, therefore, cannot be to create any primary impulse which is lacking in the uneducated, 
the purpose can only be to enlarge the scope of those that human nature provides increasing the number and variety of attendant thoughts and by showing where the most permanent satisfaction is to be found under the impulse of a calvinistic order of the natural man this obvious truth has been too often misconceived in the training of the young nature has been falsely regarded as excluding all that is best in what is natural the endeavor to teach virtue has led to the production of stunted and contorted hypocrites instead of full-grown human beings from such mistakes in education a better psychology or a kinder heart is beginning to preserve the present generation we need therefore waste no more words on the theory that the purpose of education is to thwart or eradicate nature but although nature must supply the initial forces of desire nature is not in the civilized man the spasmodic fragmentary and yet violent set of impulses that it is in the savage each impulse has its constitutional ministry of thought and knowledge and reflection through which possible conflicts of impulses are foreseen and temporary impulses are controlled by the unifying impulse which may be called wisdom in this way education destroys the crudity of instinct and increases through knowledge the wealth and variety of the individual's context with the outside world making him no longer an isolated fighting unit but a citizen of the universe embracing distant countries remote regions of space and vast stretches of past and future within the circle of his interest it is this simultaneous softening in the instance of desire and enlargement of its scope that is the chief moral end of education closely connected to this moral end is the more purely intellectual aims of education the endeavor to make us see and imagine the world in an objective manner and far as possible as it is in itself and not merely through the disordering medium of personal desire the complete attainment of such an objective view is no doubt an ideal indefinitely approachable but not actually fully realizable education considered as a process of forming our mental habits and our outlook on the world is to be judged successful in proportion as its outcome approximates to this ideal that is to say as it gives us a true view of our place in society of the relation of the whole human society and its non-human environment and the nature of the non-human world as it is in itself apart from our own desires and interests if this standard is admitted we can return to the considerations of science inquiring how far science contributes to such an aim and whether it is in any aspect superior to its rivals in educational practice two opposite and at first sight conflicting merits belong to sciences as against literature and art the one which is not inherently necessary but is certainly true at present day is hopefulness as to the future of human achievement in particular as to the useful work that may be accomplished by any intelligent student this merit and the cheerful outlook which it engenders prevent what might otherwise be the depressing effect of another aspect of science to my mind also a merit and perhaps its greatest merit i mean the irrelevance of human passions and the wholly subjective apparatus where scientific truth is concerned each of these reasons for preferring the study of science requires some amplification let us begin with the first in the study of literature or art our attention is perpetually riveted upon the past the men of greece or of the renaissance did better than any do now the tribes of former ages so far from facilitating tribes in their own age actually increased the difficulty of fresh tribes by rendering originality harder of attainment not only is artistic achievement not cumulative but it seems even to depend upon a certain freshness and naivete of impulse and vision which civilization tends to destroy hence comes to those who have been nourished on the literary and artistic productions of former agents a certain peevishness and undue fastidiousness towards the present from which there seems no escape except in the deliberate vandalism which ignores tradition 
and in the search after originality achieves only the eccentric but in such vandalism there is none of the simplicity and spontaneity out of which great art springs theory is still the cancrean's core insincerity destroys the advantage of a merely pretended ignorance the despair of thus arriving from an education which suggests no preeminent mental activity except that of artistic creation is wholly absent from an education which gives the knowledge of scientific method the discovery of scientific method except in pure mathematics is a thing of yesterday speaking broadly we may say that it dates from galileo yet already it has transformed the world and its success proceeds with ever accelerating velocity in science men have discovered an activity of the very highest value in which they are no longer as an art dependent or progress upon the appearance of continually greater genius for in science the successors stand upon the shoulders of their predecessors where one man of supreme genius has invented a method a thousand lesser men can apply it no transcendent ability is required in order to make useful discoveries in science the edifice of science needs its masons bricklayers and common laborers as well as its foremen master builders and architects in art nothing worth doing can be done without genius in science even a very moderate capacity can contribute to a supreme achievement in science in science the man of real genius is the man who invents a new method the notable discoveries are often made by its successors who can apply their method with fresh vigor unimpaired by the previous labor of perfecting it but the mental caliber of the thought required for their work however brilliant is not so great as that required by the first inventor of the method there are in science immense numbers of different methods appropriate to different classes of problems but over and above them all there is something not easily definable which may be called the method of science it was formerly customary to identify this with the inductive method and to associate with it the name of bacon but the true inductive method was not discovered by bacon and the true method of science is something which includes deduction as much as induction logic and mathematics as much as botany and geology i shall not attempt the difficult task of stating what the scientific method is but i will try to indicate the temper of mind out of which the scientific method grows which is the second of the two merits that were mentioned above as belonging to a scientific education the kernel of the scientific outlook is a thing so simple so obvious so seemingly trivial that the mention of it may almost excite derision the kernel of the scientific outlook is the refusal to regard our own desires tastes and interests as affording a key to the understanding of the world stated this baldly this may seem no more than a trite truism but to remember it consistently in matters arousing our passionate partisanship is by no means easy especially where the available evidence is uncertain and inconclusive a few illustrations will make it clear aristotle i understand considered that the stars must move in circles because the circle is the most perfect curve in the absence of evidence to the contrary he allowed himself to decide a question of fact by an appeal to aesthetical moral considerations in such a case it is at once obvious to us that this appeal was unjustifiable we know now how to ascertain as a fact the way in which the heavenly bodies move and we know that they do not move in circles or even in accurate ellipses or in any other kind of simply describable curve this may be painful to a certain hankering after simplicity of pattern in the universe we know that in astronomy such feelings are irrelevant easy as this knowledge seems now we owe it to the courage and insight of the first inventors of scientific method and more especially of galileo we take as another illustration malthus's doctrine of population this illustration is all the better for the fact that his actual doctrine is now known to be largely erroneous it is not his conclusions that are valuable but the temper and method of his inquiry as everyone knows it was to him 
that darwin owed an essential part of his theory of natural selection and this was only possible because malthus's outlook was truly scientific his great merit lies in considering man not as the object of praise or blame but as part of nature a thing with a certain characteristic behavior from which certain consequences must follow if the behavior is not quite what malthus supposed if the consequences are not quite what he inferred that may falsify his conclusions but does not impair the value of his method the objections which were made when his doctrine was new that it was horrible and depressing that people ought not to act as he said they did and so on were all such as implied an unscientific attitude of mind as against all of them his calm determination to treat man as a natural phenomena marks an important advance over the reformers of the eighteenth century and the revolution under the influence of darwinism the scientific attitude towards man has now become fairly common and it is to some people quite natural though to most it is still a difficult and artificial intellectual contortion there is however one study which is as yet almost wholly untouched by the scientific spirit i mean the study of philosophy philosophers and the public image that the scientific spirit must pervade pages that bristle with allusions to ions germ plasms in the eyes of shellfish but as the devil can quote scripture so the philosopher can quote science the scientific spirit is not an affair of quotation of externally required information any more than manners are an affair of the etiquette book the scientific attitude of mind involves a sweeping away of all other desires in the interest of the desire to know it involves suppression of hopes and fears loves and hates and the whole subjective emotional life until we become subdued to the material able to see it frankly without preconceptions without bias without any wish except to see it as it is and without any belief that what it is must be determined by some relation positive or negative to what we should like it to be or what we can easily imagine it to be now in philosophy this attitude of mind has not yet been achieved a certain self-absorption not personal but human has marked almost all attempts to conceive the universe as a whole mind or some aspect of it thought or will or sentience has been regarded as the pattern after which the universe is to be conceived for no better reason at bottom than that such a universe would not seem strange and would give us the cosy feeling that every place is like home to conceive the universe as essentially progressive or essentially deteriorating for example is to give to our hopes and fears a cosmic importance which may of course be justified but which we have as yet no reason to suppose justified until we have learned to think of it in ethically neutral terms we have not arrived at a scientific attitude in philosophy and until we have arrived at such an attitude it is hardly to be hoped but philosophy will achieve any solid results i have spoken so far largely of the negative aspects of the scientific spirit but it is from the positive aspect that its value is derived the instinct of constructiveness which is one of the chief incentives to artistic creation can find in scientific systems a satisfaction more massive than any epic poem disinterested curiosity which is the source of almost all intellectual effort finds with the astonished delight that science can unveil secrets which might well have seemed forever undiscoverable the desire for a larger life and wider interests or an escape from private circumstances and even from the whole recurring human cycle of birth and death is fulfilled by the impersonal cosmic outlook of science as by nothing else to all these must be added as contributing to the happiness of the man of science the admiration of splendid achievement and the consciousness of an estimable utility to the human race a life devoted to science is therefore a happy life and its happiness is derived from the very best sources that are open to the dwellers on this troubled and passionate planet End of the place of science in a liberal education by Bertrand Russell.
Friedrich Schiller's Preface to the Robbers, published in 1781. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Schiller's Preface as Prefixed to the First Edition of the Robbers, published in 1781 now first translated into English. This play is to be regarded merely as a dramatic narrative in which, for the purpose of tracing out the innermost workings of the soul, advantage has been taken of the dramatic method, without otherwise conforming to the stringent rules of theatrical composition, or seeking the dubious advantage of stage adaptation it must be admitted as somewhat inconsistent that three very remarkable people whose acts are dependent on perhaps a thousand contingencies should be completely developed within three hours considering that it would scarcely be possible in the ordinary course of events that three such remarkable people should even in twenty-four hours fully reveal their characters to the most penetrating inquirer a greater amount of incident is here crowded together than it was possible for me to confine within the narrow limits prescribed by aristotle and batal it is however not so much the bulk of my play as its contents which banish it from the stage its scheme and economy require that several characters should appear who would offend the finer feelings of virtue and shock the delicacy of our manners every delineator of human character is placed in the same dilemma if he proposes to give a faithful picture of the world as it really is and not an ideal fantasy a mere creation of his own it is the course of mortal things that the good should be shadowed by the bad and virtue shine the brightest when contrasted with vice whoever proposes to discourage vice and to vindicate religion morality and social order against their enemies must unveil crime in all its deformity and place it before the eyes of men in its colossal magnitude he must diligently explore its dark mazes and make himself familiar with sentiments at the wickedness of which his soul revolts vice is here exposed in its innermost workings in francis it resolves all the confused terrors of conscience into wild abstractions destroys virtuous sentiments by dissecting them and holds up the earnest voice of religion to mockery and scorn he who has gone so far a distinction by no means enviable as to quicken his understanding at the expense of his soul to him the holiest things are no longer holy to him god and man are alike indifferent and both worlds are as nothing of such a monster i have endeavoured to sketch a striking and lifelike portrait to hold up to abhorrence all the machinery of his scheme of vice and to test its strength by contrasting it with truth how far my narrative is successful in accomplishing these objects the reader is left to judge my conviction is that i have painted nature to the life next to this man francis stands another who would perhaps puzzle not a few of my readers a mind for which the greatest crimes have only charms through the glory which attaches to them the energy which their perpetration requires and the danger which attend them a remarkable and important personage abundantly endowed with the powers of becoming either a brutus or a catiline according as that power is directed an unhappy conjunction of circumstances determines him to choose the latter for his example and it is only after a fearful strain that he is recalled to emulate the former erroneous notions of activity and power an exuberance of strength which bursts through all the barriers of law must of necessity conflict with the rules of social life to these enthusiastic dreams of greatness and efficiency it needed but a sarcastic bitterness against the unpoetic spirit of the age to complete the strange don quixote whom in the robber moor 
we at once detest and love admire and pity it is i hope unnecessary to remark that i no more hold up this picture as a warning exclusively to robbers than the greatest spanish satire was levelled exclusively at knight-errants it is nowadays so much the fashion to be witty at the expense of religion that a man will hardly pass for a genius if he does not allow his impious satire to run a tilt at its most sacred truths the noble simplicity of holy writ must needs be abused and turned into ridicule at the daily assemblies of the so-called wits for what is there so holy and serious that will not raise a laugh if a false sense be attached to it let me hope that i shall have rendered no inconsiderable service to the cause of true religion and morality in holding up these wanton misbelievers to the detestation of society under the form of the most despicable robbers but still more i have made these said immoral characters to stand out favourably in particular points and even in some measure to compensate by qualities of the head for what they are deficient in those of the heart herein i have done no more than literally copy nature every man even the most depraved bears in some degree the impress of the almighty's image and perhaps the greatest villain is not farther removed from the most upright man than the petty offender for the moral forces keep even pace with the powers of the mind and the greater the capacity bestowed on man the greater and more enormous becomes his misapplication of it the more responsible is he for his heirs the adramalek of klopstock and his messiah awakens in us a feeling in which admiration is blended with detestation we follow milton satan with shuddering wonder through the pathless realms of chaos the media of the old dramatist is in spite of all her crimes a great and wondrous woman and shakespeare's richard the third is sure to excite the admiration of the reader much as he would hate the reality if it is to be my task to portray men as they are i must at the same time include their good qualities of which even the most vicious are never totally destitute if i would warn mankind against the tiger i must not omit to describe his glossy beautiful marked skin lest owing to this omission the ferocious animal should not be recognized till too late besides this a man who is so utterly depraved as to be without a single redeeming point is no meet subject for art and would disgust rather than excite the interest of the reader who would turn over with impatience the pages which concern him a noble soul can no more endure a succession of moral discords than the musical ear the grating of knives upon glass and for this reason i should have been ill-advised in attempting to bring my drama on the stage a certain strength of mind is required both on the part of the poet and the reader in the former that he may not disguise vice in the latter that he may not suffer brilliant qualities to beguile him into admiration of what is essentially detestable whether the author has fulfilled his duty he leaves others to judge that his readers will perform theirs he by no means feels assured the vulgar among whom i would not be understood to mean merely the rabble the vulgar i say between ourselves extend their influence far around and unfortunately set the fashion too short-sighted to reach my full meaning too narrow-minded to comprehend the largeness of my views too disingenuous to admit my moral aim they will i fear almost frustrate my good intentions and pretend to discover in my work an apology for the very vice which it has been my object to condemn and will perhaps make the poor poet to whom anything rather than justice is usually accorded responsible for his simplicity thus we have a da capo of the story of democritus and the abderitans 
and our worthy hippocrates would need exhaust whole plantations of hellbore were it proposed to remedy this mischief by a healing decoction let as many friends of truth as you will instruct their fellow citizens in the pulpit and on the stage the vulgar will never cease to be vulgar though the sun and moon may change their course and heaven and earth wax old as a garment perhaps in order to please tender-hearted people i might have been less true to nature but if a certain beetle of whom we have all heard could extract filth even from pearls if we have examples that fire has destroyed and water deluged shall therefore pearls and fire and water be condemned in consequence of the remarkable catastrophe which ends my play i may justly claim for it a place among books of morality for crime meets at last with the punishment it deserves the lost one enters again within the pale of the law and virtue is triumphant whoever would be but courteous enough towards me to read my work through with a desire to understand it from him i may expect not that he will admire the poet but that he will esteem the honest man schiller easter fair seventeen eighty one end of friedrich schiller's preface to the robbers published in seventeen eighty one the story of a daughter's love from threads of gray and gold by myrtle reed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org aaron burr was past master of what whistler calls the gentle art of making enemies probably no man ever lived who was more bitterly hated or more fiercely reviled even at this day when he has been dead more than half a century his memory is still assailed it is the popular impression that he was a villain perhaps he was since where there is smoke there must be fire but happily we have no concern with the political part of his life whatever he may have been and whatever dark deeds he may have done there still remains a redeeming feature which no one has denied him his love for his daughter theodosia one must remember that before burr was two years old his father mother and grandparents were all dead he was reared by an uncle timothy edwards who doubtless did his best but the odds were against the homeless child neither must we forget that he fought in the revolution bravely and well from his early years he was very attractive to women he was handsome distinguished well dressed and gifted in many ways he was generous ready at compliments and gallantry and possessed an all-compelling charm in the autumn of seventeen seventy seven his regiment was detailed for scouting duty in new jersey which was then the debatable ground between colonial and british armies in january of seventeen seventy nine colonel burr was given command of the lines in westchester county new york it was at this time that he first met mrs prevost the widow of a british officer she lived across the hudson some fifteen miles from shore and the river was patrolled by the gunboats of the british and the land by their sentries in spite of these difficulties however burr managed to make two calls upon the lady although they were both necessarily informal he sent six of his trusted soldiers to a place on the hudson where there was an overhanging bank under which they moored a large boat well supplied with blankets and buffalo robes at nine o'clock in the evening he left white plains on the smallest and swiftest horse he could procure and when he reached the rendezvous the horse was quickly bound and laid in the boat burr and the six troopers stepped in and in half an hour they were across the ferry the horse was lifted out and unbound and with a little rubbing he was again ready for duty 
Before midnight, Burr was at the house of his beloved, and at four in the morning he came back to the troopers awaiting him on the river bank, and the return trip was made in the same manner. For a year and a half after leaving the army, Burr was an invalid, but in July 1782 he married Mrs. Prevost. She was a widow with two sons, and was ten years older than her husband. Her health was delicate, and she had a scar on her forehead, but her mind was finely cultivated, and her manners charming. Long after her death, he said that if his manners were more graceful than those of some men, it was due to her influence, and that his wife was the truest woman and most charming lady he had ever known. It has been claimed by some that Burr's married life was not a happy one, but there are many letters still extant which passed between them which seem to prove the contrary. Before marriage he did not often write to her, but during his absences afterward the fondest wife could have no reason to complain. For instance, This morning came your truly welcome letter of Monday evening he wrote her at one time. Where did it loiter so long? Nothing in my absence is so flattering to me as your health and cheerfulness. I then contemplate nothing so eagerly as my return, amuse myself with ideas of my own happiness, and dwell upon the sweet domestic joys which I fancy prepared for me. Nothing is so unfriendly to every species of enjoyment as melancholy. Gloom, however dressed, however caused, is incompatible with friendship. They cannot have place in the mind at the same time. It is the secret, the malignant foe of sentiment and love. He always wrote fondly of the children. My love to the smiling little girl, he said in one letter. I continually plan my return with childish impatience and fancy a thousand incidents which are most interesting. After five years of married life, the wife wrote him as follows. Your letters always afford me a singular satisfaction, a sensation entirely my own. This was peculiarly so. It wrought strangely upon my mind and spirits. My Aaron, it was replete with tenderness and with the most lively affection. I read and re-read, till afraid I should get it by rote, and mingle it with common ideas. Soon after Burr entered politics, his wife developed cancer of the most virulent character. Everything that money or available skill could accomplish was done for her, but she died after a lingering and painful illness in the spring of 1794. They had lived together happily for twelve years, and he grieved for her deeply and sincerely. Yet the greatest and most absorbing passion of his life was for his daughter, Theodosia, who was named for her mother and was born in the first year of their marriage. When little Theodosia was first laid in her father's arms, all that was best in him answered to her mute plea for his affection, and later all that was best in him responded to her baby smile. Between those two there was ever the fullest confidence, never tarnished by doubt or mistrust, and when all the world forsook him, Theodosia, grown to womanhood, stood proudly by her father's side and shared his blame as if it had been the highest honor. When she was a year or two old, they moved to a large house at the corner of Cedar and Nassau Streets in New York City. A large garden surrounded it, and there were grapevines in the rear. Here the child grew strong and healthy, and laid the foundations of her girlish beauty and mature charm. When she was but three years old, her mother wrote to the father, saying, Your dear little Theodosia cannot hear you spoken of without an apparent melancholy insomuch that her nurse is obliged to exert her invention to divert her and myself avoid the mention of you in her presence she was one whole day indifferent to everything but your name her attachment is not of a common nature and again 
your dear little daughter seeks you twenty times a day calls you to your meals and will not suffer your chair to be filled by any of the family the child was educated as if she had been a boy she learned to read latin and greek fluently and the accomplishments of her time were not neglected when she was at school the father wrote her regularly and did not allow one of her letters to wait a day for its affectionate answer he corrected her spelling and her grammar instilled sound truths into her mind and formed her habits from this plastic clay with inexpressible love and patient toil he shaped his ideal woman she grew into a beautiful girl her features were much like her father's she was petite graceful plump rosy dignified and gracious in her manner there was a calm assurance the air of mastery over all situations which she doubtless inherited from him when she was eighteen years of age she married joseph alston of south carolina and with much pain at parting from her father she went there to live after seeing him inaugurated as jefferson's vice-president his only consolation was her happiness and when he returned to new york he wrote her that he approached the old house as if it had been the sepulchre of all his friends dreary solitary comfortless it was no longer home after her mother's death theodosia had been the lady of his household and reigned at the head of his table when he went back there was no loved face opposite him and the chill and loneliness struck him to the heart for three years after her marriage theodosia was blissfully happy a boy was born to her and was named aaron burr alston the vice-president visited them in the south and took his namesake unreservedly into his heart if i can see without prejudice he said there never was a finer boy his last act before fighting the duel with hamilton was writing to his daughter a happy gay carefree letter giving no hint of what was impending to her husband he wrote in a different strain begging him to keep the event from her as long as possible to make her happy always and to encourage her in those habits of study which he himself had taught her she had parted from him with no other pain in her heart than the approaching separation when they met again he was a fugitive from justice travel-stained from his long journey in an open canoe indicted for murder in new york and in new jersey although still president of the senate and vice-president of the united states the girl's heart ached bitterly yet no word of censure escaped her lips and she still held her head high when his mexican scheme was overthrown theodosia sat beside him at his trial wearing her absolute faith so that all the world might see when he was preparing for his flight to europe theodosia was in new york and they met by night secretly at the house of friends just before he sailed they spent a whole night together making the best of the little time that remained to them before the inevitable separation early in june they parted little dreaming that they should see each other no more during the years of exile theodosia suffered no less than he mr alston had lost his faith in aaron burr and the woman's heart strained beneath the burden her health failed her friends shrank from her yet openly and bravely she clung to her father public opinion showed no signs of relenting and his evil genius followed him across the sea he was expelled from england and in paris he was almost a prisoner at one time he was obliged to live upon potatoes and dry bread and his devoted daughter could not help him he was despised by his countrymen but theodosia's adoring love never faltered in one of her letters she said i witness your extraordinary fortitude with new wonder at every misfortune 
often after reflecting on this subject you appear to me so superior so elevated above other men i contemplate you with such a strange mixture of humility admiration reverence love and pride that a very little superstition would be necessary to make me worship you as a superior being such enthusiasm does your character excite in me when i afterward revert to myself how insignificant do my best qualities appear my own vanity would be greater if i had not been placed so near you and yet my pride is in our relationship i had rather not live than not be the daughter of such a man she wrote to mrs madison and asked her to intercede with the president for her father the answer gave the required assurance and she wrote to her father urging him to go boldly to new york and resume the practice of his profession if worse comes to worst she wrote i will leave everything to suffer with you he landed in boston and went on to new york in may of eighteen twelve where his reception was better than he had hoped and where he soon had a lucrative practice they planned for him to come south in the summer and she was almost happy again when her child died and her mother's heart was broken she had borne much and she never recovered from that last blow her health failed rapidly and though she was too weak to undertake the trip she insisted upon going to new york to see her father thinking the voyage might prove beneficial her husband reluctantly consented and passage was engaged for her on a pilot boat that had been out privateering and had stopped for supplies before going on to new york the vessel sailed and a storm swept the atlantic coast from maine to florida it was supposed that the ship went down off cape hatteras but forty years afterward a sailor who died in texas confessed on his deathbed that he was one of a crew of mutineers who took possession of the patriot and forced the passengers as well as the officers and men to walk the plank he professed to remember mrs alston well and said she was the last one who perished he never forgot her look of despair as she stepped into the sea with her head held high even in the face of death among theodosia's papers was found a letter addressed to her husband written at a time when she was weary of the struggle on the envelope was written my husband to be delivered after my death i wish this to be read immediately and before my burial he never saw the letter for he never had the courage to go through her papers and after his death it was sent to her father it came to him like a message from the grave let my father see my son sometimes she had written do not be unkind to him whom i have loved so much i beseech of you burn all my papers except my father's letters which i beg you to return to him a long time afterward her father married madame jumel a rich new york woman who was many years his junior but the alliance was unfortunate and was soon annulled through all the rest of his life he never wholly gave up the hope that theodosia might return he clung fondly to the belief that she had been picked up by another ship and some day would be brought back to him day by day he haunted the battery anxiously searching the faces of the incoming passengers asking some of them for tidings of his daughter and always believing that the next ship would bring her back he became a familiar figure for he was almost always there a bent shrunken little man white-haired leaning heavily upon his cane asking questions in a thin piping voice and straining his dim eyes forever toward the unsounded waters from whence the idol of his heart never came for out within those waters cruel changeless she sleeps beyond all rage of earth or sea a smile upon her dear lips dumb but waiting and i i hear the sea voice calling me end of the story of a daughter's love 
from Threads of Grey and Gold by Myrtle Reed. Read by Elizabeth Parsons. Tor Abbey by Abbot Francis Aidan Gasquet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The situation of Tor Abbey in the olden days must have been ideal. Placed on the sea coast of Devon, it looked southward across Tor Bay towards Brixham, and it is said to have been the best provided of all the five-and-thirty houses of the English Premonstratensian canons. It was founded in 1196 by William Brinier, was endowed with much property in the neighbourhood, and was given the patronage of several churches and chapels. The Abbey of Welbeck became the mother house of Tor, sending one of their number, Adam, with six companions to start it, but after three years and a half, Adam was translated to Newhouse as abbot. The list of the superiors at Tor is far from complete, and little is known of the history of this important abbey beyond what may be gathered from the lately published records of the order in England. One curious story connected with the house in the 14th century has been preserved in the register of Bishop Brantingham of Exeter in thirteen ninety the bishop solemnly excommunicated the unknown person or persons who had spread abroad a story that the abbot of tor william norton had murdered and beheaded one of his canons simon hastings this accusation the bishop pronounced to be an infamous and malicious falsehood all the more clearly so as the canon in question was actually alive and had been seen by many both at his abbey and elsewhere in the year fourteen fifty six the abbot of st Radegund's was the representative in england of the abbot of premontre as such he possessed all powers of visitation over the houses of the order and was answerable to the chapter of premonstratensians for the good discipline of the english branch acting in that capacity on september the tenth fourteen fifty six he wrote to the abbot of tor richard cade then recently appointed about certain rumours he had heard concerning the prior william answell his influence in the house was a bad one according to reports as he was a sower of discord and contention and the visitor directs that the prior be forthwith sent to him at st Radegund's that the matter be inquired into in the same letter the writer says that he understands that the monastic property has been squandered that the abbot does not take advice has taken two great burdens on the house and has not tried to put a stop to the hurtful dissensions which take place in his monastery he further suggests to him the propriety of resigning his office as abbot in fourteen seventy eight we have the first of the regular series of visitations which afford an insight into the inner history of tor for the last quarter of the fifteenth century in that year bishop redmond who was also abbot of shap and visitor of the order in england appointed by the abbot general of premontre came to tor on august the first on his first visitation one canon confessed before him the crime of apostasy theft and rebellion which having been put into plain language meant leaving his enclosure without permission disobeying his superior and spending money without leave he was sent to do penance at the monastery of newhouse for forty days on bread and water followed by three years imprisonment and a further detention there for another term of ten years another canon accused of apostasy in the same sense was ordered to welbeck to undergo similar punishment bishop redmond enjoined the abbot to try and increase the number of the religious at tor by every means in his power and he gave certain regulations for the community life the brethren were not to drink after compline without urgent need and never without full permission the time of vespers was to be at four o'clock both summer and winter and all were to be in bed by eight p m 
he praises the general administration of the abbot however and does not find anything of grave importance to correct or to refer to the general chapter in his next visitation on september the twenty first fourteen eighty two bishop redman is able to praise the administration of abbot cade in high terms in obtaining what is for the good of the monastery he says the abbot is provident and circumspect beyond any other abbot of the order at this time one of the canons was accused of breaking open the abbot's treasury but on inquiry he was able to clear himself the visitor finds that silence might be kept better and that the tonsure was getting too big but there are no grave matters to be corrected or reported to the chapter incidentally we see from the document that the abbot was getting somewhat old and infirm he was dead before the next visit and the bishop charges the community to try and assist him when his troubles and sickness should increase upon him and he should become less able to see to all things himself it is six years before there is any record of another visit to the abbey this time for some reason out of solicitude for the monastery the document says the bishop did not actually come to tor itself he remained at their house of durford in sussex and thither the abbot and a proctor for the community went to meet him in this visit he gives the best report to his investigations everything is in an excellent state through the administration of the abbot now thomas dare or dyer and the community have a filial affection for him and obey him in all confidence at the time of the abbot's appointment the house was in debt by fifty marks now that sum has been paid and a hundred marks are due to them in the same way the stock and grain has increased by his circumspect provision three years later on may the twenty fourth fourteen ninety one bishop redman comes again to tor to discharge his duty as visitor this time a grave charge of incontinence is brought against one of the community but after full and patient inquiry the visitor finds him innocent but imprudent he urges on all the need of being on their guard to avoid giving any occasion for suspicion by their conduct he reminds them of the rule of the order that no one is to eat or drink in any house within a league of their monastery and he forbids all games played for money especially the game of tennis the canons evidently took the admonition of the visitor to heart and as a community pulled themselves together for three years later on june the twelfth fourteen ninety four the bishop was able to declare after examination that he had found all things in good order and all laws faithfully observed by both superior and subjects the community also at this time were in a flourishing state there were no less than six novices on the list all of whom persevered and appear in the list three years later as canons professed bishop redmond made two other visitations of tor in fourteen ninety seven and in fifteen hundred he had now become bishop of exeter in which diocese tor abbey was situated in order therefore to safeguard for the abbey its privilege of exemption from episcopal visitation on each of these occasions he protests that he has come to visit the place not as bishop of exeter but as the commissary of the abbot of premontre which office he still continues to hold in fourteen ninety seven he finds everything in a most satisfactory state the place he says is governed in all things to the honour of god and to the good of the monastery so much is this so that nothing whatever there offended my sight but everything proper to a holy life in the visitation of fifteen hundred the bishop renews his commendation of the rule of the abbot he finds all things in an excellent state but corrects two of the canons for carelessness in regard to silence the community is seen to have increased in numbers in this last glimpse we get of it twenty years before it was fourteen now it is eighteen 
four of whom are novices the last abbot was simon reed elected and confirmed by the king in august fifteen twenty three he and his fellow canons surrendered the monastery to the king february the twenty third fifteen thirty nine before the commissioner william petrie the abbot and his religious each received a pension one of the canons john estridge died within a month of his being expelled from his old home the church was two hundred feet long but very little of it remains by which to judge of its architecture there are now standing of the church only portions of the central tower the east end of the choir a south chapel and of the domestic buildings the entrance of the chapter house the refectory a fourteenth century building fifty two feet by twenty five feet and a large gateway of the same date of the outbuildings a fine decorated barn one hundred and twenty feet long still stands dr oliver says of tor that nothing can exceed the beautiful situation of this great abbey and if we may judge by the remains of the church of the chapter house and other buildings the magnificence of the fabric did honour to the situation when leland visited the abbey three fair gateways were standing one gateway remains the sale of the buildings and effects of the abbey began immediately here as elsewhere in the accounts of the year ending michaelmas 1540 sir john arundel credits the augmentation office with the amount of forty three pounds ten shillings for the sale of bells and superfluous buildings at tor during the same time the same agent had expended seventy nine pounds thirteen shillings and sevenpence in devon and cornwall in defacing breaking up and pulling down divers churches bell towers cloisters and other buildings of late monasteries sir john arundel likewise acknowledges having received from various rents of tor lands one hundred and eighty pounds seven shillings and three halfpence two grants of the property are registered the year after the dissolution one on march the fourth fifteen forty to sir john ridgeway and the second on march the tenth to sir roger bewitt the receipts from the rents paid in fifteen forty to sir thomas arundel were two hundred and ninety four pounds eight shillings and twopence three farthings end of tor abbey by Abbot Francis Aidan Gasquet. Way Down East by Albert Bigelow Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Way Down East from Life and Lillian Gish by albert bigelow payne griffith now began work on his greatest melodrama way down east had been successful as a book and a play and was precisely the sort of thing he could do best from william a brady for a large sum he secured the picture rights and plunged into production there were to be two great outdoor scenes a blizzard in which the heroine who has been inveigled into a mock marriage and is therefore under the new england code fallen and outcast is lost and the frozen river which blinded and desperate she reaches to be carried to the falls on a cake of ice there was very little that was artificial about such scenes in that day the blizzard had to be a real one the ice real ice most of it at any rate griffith began rehearsing some scenes at claridge's hotel in new york continuing steadily for eight weeks but all the time there was an order that in case of a blizzard night or day all hands were to report to the mamaronek studio lillian had taken stanford white's house on orient point reading the play she knew it was going to be an endurance test and went into training for it cold baths 
walks in the cold against the wind exercises she had faith in her body being equal to any emergency if prepared for it in a magazine article a few years later she wrote the memorable day of march sixth arrived and with it a snowstorm and a ninety mile an hour gale as i was living at mamaroneck near the studio i quickly reported and was made up as an amour ready but not eager for the work to be done the scene to be taken was the one just after the irate squire bartlett turns anna out of the house into the storm dazed and all but frozen she wanders about through the snow and finally to the river the griffith studio was on a point or arm well out in long island sound the wind swept this narrow strip with great fury the cameras had their backs to the gale she had to face it she had been out only a short time when her face became caked with snow around her eyes this would melt her lashes became small icicles griffith wanted this and brought the cameras up close her lids were so heavy she could scarcely keep them open no need of spectacular falls the difficulty was to keep her feet she was beaten back flung about like a toy her face became drawn and twisted almost out of human semblance when she could stand no more and was half unconscious they would pull her back to the studio on a little sled and give her hot tea a brief rest and back to the gale griffith had invested a large sum in the picture and she must make good one could not count on another blizzard that season harry carr writes that blizzard scene in way down east was real it was taken in the most god-awful blizzard i ever saw three men lay flat to hold the legs of each camera i went out four times in order to be a hero but sneaked back suffocated and half dead lillian stuck out there in front of the cameras d w would ask her if she could stand it and she would nod the icicles hung from her lashes and her face was blue when the last shot was made they had to carry her to the studio a week or two later they were at white river junction vermont for the ice scenes griffith took a good many of his company and they put up at an old-fashioned hotel a place of hospitality and good food white river junction is at the confluence of the white and the connecticut rivers there is no fall there but the current moves at the rate of six miles an hour and the water is deep the ice was from twelve to sixteen inches thick and a good-sized piece of it made a fairly safe route but it was wet and slippery and very cold it was frozen solid when they arrived had to be sawed and dynamited to get pieces for the floating scene lillian conceived the idea of letting her hand and hair drag in the water it was effective but her hand became frosted the chances of pneumonia increased to the writer recently richard bartholmus who had the star part opposite lillian said not once but twenty times a day for two weeks lillian floated down on a cake of ice and i made my way to her stepping from one cape to another to rescue her i had on a heavy fur coat and if i had slipped or if one of the cakes had cracked and let me through my chances would not have been good as for lillian why she did not get pneumonia i still can't understand she has a wonderful constitution before we started griffith had us insured against accident and sickness lillian frail as she looked, was the only one of the company who passed 100% perfect condition and health. No accidents happened. The story that I missed a signal and did not reach Lillian in time, and that she came near going over the falls, would indicate that she made the float on the ice cake but once. As I said, she made it numberless times, and there were no falls. Lillian was never nervous, and never afraid. I don't think either of us thought of anything serious happening, though when I was carrying her, stepping from one ice cake to another, 
we might easily have slipped in i would not make that picture again for any money that a producer would be willing to pay for it at the end of the ice scene there is an instant when the cake at the brink of a fall seems to start over just as Bartholomus carrying lillian steps from it to another and another half slipping in before he reaches the bank the critical moment at the brink of the fall was made in summer time at winchell smith's farm near farmington connecticut the ice cakes here were painted blocks of wood or boxes and were attached to piano wire there was a real fall of fifteen feet at this place and once a carpenter went over and was considerably damaged in the picture as shown niagara was blended into this fall with startling effect Bartholomew remembers that lillian kept mostly to herself she took her work very seriously too much so in the opinion of her associates but once there was a barn dance at the hotel in which she joined and once she and Bartholomew drove over to dartmouth college not far distant with mr and mrs elmer clifton to a dinner given them by Bartholomew's fraternity after dinner they heard a great tramp tramp and someone said to lillian it's the college boys coming to kidnap you they sometimes did such things for a lark but they only wanted to pay their respects they gathered outside the window which mr clifton opened and both lillian and Bartholomew spoke to them through it the summer scenes of way down east were made at farmington and at the mamaroneck studio griffith had selected a fine cast among them lowell sherman the villain burr mackintosh as squire bartlett kate bruce his wife mary hay their niece and vivia ogden the village gossip the scene where squire bartlett drives anna moore from his home was realistic in its harshness and poor burr mackintosh a sweet soul who long before had played taffy in trilby and who loved lillian dearly could never get over having been obliged to turn her out into the storm often in after years he begged her to forgive him a few minor incidents connected with the making of way down east may be recalled griffith had spent a great sum of money for the rights two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars it is said and was spending a great many more thousands producing it he was naturally on a good deal of attention all were working to the limit of their strength but they could not hold the pitch indefinitely when Bartholomew, who is short had to stand on a two-inch piece of board to cope on terms of equality with lowell sherman sherman who was a trained actor of the stage could and did make invisible side remarks which made Bartholomew laugh whereupon griffith raged at the waste of time and film and everybody was sorry the villain penitent stop that laughing turn around and face the camera were sharp admonitions perpetuated by a right about face in the picture to this day it was harsh in form rather than by intention they did not resent these scoldings they believed in griffith knew something of his problems wanted him to make good there was one scene during which griffith had no word to offer the scene in which anna moore lillian baptizes her dying child harry carr writes the only time i ever saw a stagehand cry was in the baptism scene in way down east it was made in a boxed off corner with only d w lillian the cameraman a stagehand and myself there everybody cried it never made the same impression on the screen because it was necessary to interrupt the action with the subtitles you saw her dripping the water on the baby's head then a subtitle flashed on saying in the name of the father etc and the spell was broken carr lillian and griffith would sit far into the night watching rushes from the scenes made the day before it was a drowsy occupation so many of the same thing and after a day in the open it was not surprising that carr should nod across a misty plain of sleep griffith's voice would come to him which shot do you like best carr it is noticeable in the baptism scene that lillian sits relaxed her knees apart 
that when she leaves the house she walks with a dragging step as one who had recently experienced the struggle and agonies of childbirth it has been suggested that she had visited a maternity hospital for these details when asked she said no i did not do that there was an old woman connected with the studio who had borne a number of children she told me all that i needed to know i learned something too from pictures of the madonna by old masters i noticed in all of them that the madonna sat with her knees apart i felt that there must be a good reason for painting her in that way she had studied out every detail of the scenes she was to play many actors even among the best work by another method they absorb the feelings of the plot fling themselves into a scene depending upon an angel to kindle the divine fire this method never was lillian's to her the bush never of itself became a burning bush she lit the fire and tended it she knew the effect she wanted to produce and found no research too tedious no rehearsal too long no effort too great to achieve her end way down east was shown in october griffith with lillian and barthelmas were present in person in the larger cities it was like a triumphal tour to present the world's darling in scenes of actual danger on the screen and then have her appear in person was to invite something in the nature of a riot reporters indulged in the most extravagant language and there was a freshet of poetry and of letters love letters many of them but letters also from persons distinctly worth while david belasco whose most beautiful blonde verdict had long since gone into the discard de Molde, wrote dear lillian gish it was a revelation to see the little girl who was with me only a few years ago moving through the pictured version of way down east with such perfect acting in this play you reach the very highest point in action charm and delightful expression it made me happy too to see how you and your name appeal to the public congratulations on a splendid piece of work and good wishes for your continued success faithfully david velasco john barrymore went even further when he wrote my dear mr griffith i have for the second time seen your picture of way down east any personal praise of yourself or your genius regarding the picture i would naturally consider redundant and a little like carrying coals to newcastle i have not the honor of knowing miss gish personally and i am afraid that any expression of feeling addressed to her she might consider impertinent i merely wish to tell you that her performance seems to me to be the most superlatively exquisite and poignantly enchaining thing that i have ever seen in my life i remember seeing deuce in this country many years ago when i imagined she must have been at the height of her powers also madame bernhardt and for sheer technical brilliancy and great emotional projection done with an almost uncanny simplicity and sincerity of method it is great fun and a great stimulant to see an american artist equal if not surpass the finest traditions of the theatre i wonder if you would be good enough to thank miss gish from all of us who are trying to do the best we know how in the theatre believe me yours very sincerely john barrymore mrs gish who was not a motion picture enthusiast made a single comment well young lady she said you set quite a high mark for yourself how are you going to live up to it way down east was one of the most popular and profitable pictures ever made net returns from it ran into the millions it has had several revivals and at the present writing winter nineteen thirty one is being shown at the cameo theatre new york with sound its day however is over taste has changed has become what an older generation might regard as unduly sophisticated depraved this with mechanical advancement the talking feature for instance tells the story a picture of even ten years ago five years ago is without a public way down east is a melodrama 
but one that at moments rises to considerable heights putting aside the spectacular features of the picture the blizzard and the ice drift where melodrama is raised to the nth degree the scene where the villain reveals to his victim that their marriage was a mockery the scene where anna moore about to be turned out into the storm denounces her betrayer and the baptismal scene already mentioned are drama and as lillian gish gave them worthy and after all what is and is not melodrama and cheap because it is human that is why we have invented for ourselves a hereafter a place away from it all of rest by green fields and running brooks very well let us agree that the play was cheap especially the comedy which was low comedy and about the record in that direction but if lillian's acting was cheap and poor then there is very little to be said for any acting which god knows may be true enough after all end of way down east by albert bigelow payne the wright brothers and their problem from story of the aeroplane by c b galbraith this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The dawn of the twentieth century was to immortalize new names in the annals of aviation. In the city of Dayton, Ohio, two brothers in a modest way were conducting a bicycle repair shop. From youth they had been inseparable in their aims and work they were the sons of bishop milton wright of the united brethren church they had each a high school education but had not attended college in eighteen seventy eight when they were boys of seven and eleven years respectively their father brought them one evening a little flying toy a small helicopter the motive power of which was furnished by a rubber band wound around the shafts of two propellers so as to drive them when wound up and released, in opposite directions. The toy was made of light material to resemble a bird. When the father released it in the presence of the wondering boys, to their astonishment it flew upward in the room, rose to the ceiling, and after fluttering there for a little while fell to the floor. They did not concern themselves much about the name of the toy, but properly called it what to their minds it most closely resembled the bat they afterward made other toys like it and discovered that as they were increased in size they flew less successfully they early developed a fondness for kite flying and in this were regarded as experts when they grew to manhood however they abandoned these boyish sports and devoted themselves industriously to their machine and repair shop the bat and the kite became memories but the memories of youth have power to shape the thoughts of manhood and this early observation and experience with aerial toys gave to wilbur and orville wright an interest in the attempts at aviation that were chronicled in the press from time to time through the decade immediately preceding this new century in the year eighteen ninety six orville the younger of the two brothers was convalescing from a serious attack of typhoid fever. Wilbur, who had been carefully attending him, was one day reading aloud an account of the death of Otto Lilienthal, the German aviator, who was killed while experimenting with his glider. The details of the tragic accident, together with an account of what he had accomplished by years of investigation and experiment, interested the brothers who resolved as soon as possible to apply themselves to the construction of a glider in which flights could be made with comparative safety. The enthusiasm of Orville over the project ran so high that it almost caused a return of the fever. As soon as he had fully recovered, the two brothers returned to their bicycle shop and applied themselves with increasing zeal to the study of aeronautics, and after a time began the construction of a glider. 
the wright brothers were peculiarly well equipped for the work upon which they had entered they were men of unflagging industry abstemious habits few words and the happy faculty of keeping their own counsel wilbur was unusually reticent it is said of him that he spoke only when he had something to say and then in a manner singularly brief and direct he had an unlimited capacity for hard work nerves of steel and the kind of daring that makes the aviator face death with pleasure every minute of the time he is in the air orville while much like his brother is more talkative and approachable both were modest and unassuming when they began their work and continued so when the world applauded their achievements in the study of the problem upon the solution of which they ventured they had of course the advantage of all that had thus far been achieved by those who had preceded them in this field of investigation and experiment professor langley had already perfected his first monoplane to such an extent that short flights were successfully made with a light steam propelled model he was continuing his experiments and the wright brothers read with avidity the results of his work every scrap of information that they could gather from others who had essayed the solution of the problem was now collected and made the subject of critical study at first taking up aeronautics merely as a sport they soon afterward with zest began its more serious pursuit we reluctantly entered upon the scientific side of it they said but we soon found the work so fascinating that we were drawn into it deeper and deeper in their efforts to construct a practical flying machine they adopted the plan of lilienthal and chanute they sought to construct a machine which they could control and in which they could make glides with safety this they built in the form of a biplane glider and with it they experimented industriously for years the successful construction of the machine required a high degree of skill the length and width of the planes their distance apart the materials to be used the shape size and position of the rudder and numerous other details were to be worked out only by patient study and frequent tests they were now in the field of original experiment and soon found that they had to reject as useless many theories that had been carefully elaborated by scholarly writers the brothers soon learned that a long narrow plane in a position nearly horizontal moved in a direction at right angles to one of its lateral edges and inclined or tipped slightly upward would develop greater lifting power than a square or circular plane this discovery was not indeed original with them but their experiments confirmed the conclusions of their predecessors the surface shape of the plane is an important consideration it has been found that a slight upward arch from beneath making the under surface concave gives the best results the concavity should reach its maximum about one-third of the distance from the front or entering edge to the rear edge of the plane and should be the same whether one or more planes are used in flight the forward or entering edges of the planes are tipped slightly upward to give the machine lifting power for the same reason that the top of a kite is given an angle of elevation so that the air will lift it as it is drawn forward by the string end of the wright brothers and their problem from story of the aeroplane by c b galbraith read by andrea k